You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And i got to tell you something, people. I love when it's, I don't know if it's coincidence or small world things happen. And that happened with my guest today, because I was on Facebook last week, and past Cooper Talk guest, Joey Medina, posted out he was deep sea fishing with other two-time past guest, uh, Cooper Talk guest, Craig Shoemaker, you know, the love master. And then just a few minutes later, I checked it out, and Joey Medina has a picture of him and my guest today. And I just love stuff like that. And it turns out that my guest's birthday was July 24th, which my father's birthday was July 23rd, and he would have been 95 this year. Anyway, my guest is Robert Hayes. How you doing, Robert? I was 95. Yeah. <laughs> so, so... How do, are you doing? I'm good. So, how do can you hear me okay? I've got these, uh, I got these new earbud things in, and I'm just making sure that they're okay. Yeah, I can hear you great. I can hear you great. Good, good. So how was how was the fishing yeah. trip? Oh, it was uh, it was fine. We went out there, and uh, you know, um, uh, the Channel Islands are gorgeous, and the, the, the boat uh, was a gentleman. Was the name of the, the boat, the fishing boat, out of Channel Islands? And the guy, the captain that runs it, is a really swell guy. And uh, so uh, we had a lot of fun. And my buddy Gregory Harrison was on it. And uh, Bob Gowen is an old friend I haven't seen for years, was there. So it was a lot of fun. Gregory's been on the show. Gregory's a great guy. And uh, so many yeah. so many um, actors, I always say this, so many actors that you talk to are just great guys. And that, that makes it, that what makes the entertainment business good. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it sure, it it doesn't wait. Now, did you catch anything? Yeah, I got some rock cod and some calico bass. and They were, uh, oh, got a barracuda, but uh, was too short, too small, so we threw that back. And uh, a couple other guys got some barracudas. That was the biggest fish of the day. It was a, I think it was Craig Schumacher. Craig got the biggest fish of the day. It was a barracuda. So, uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Yeah, so so you're originally from Bethesda. Um, when did you I get... I was born there. Okay, now, wh what was your path? I don't I don't consider that I'm from there because I was born at the Bethesda Naval Hospital, but our home was Newport Beach and Laguna and Corona del Mar down in Southern California. Dad just happened to be stationed there when I was born, so I've got my East Coast blood by, bor by birth, but... I, our, our legal address was in California, so I'm a Californian by nature. And then later, uh, uh, I've got some Nebraska in me, too, from graduating high school in Nebraska. Went to college there when I started out in college. And, uh, you know, I'm just all 15 times across country by car, so I'm very confused. I'm a confused <laughs> gypsy. No. How does a confused gypsy get into acting? Were you interested in acting when you were younger? I think that actors are all confused gypsies, so it was a natural fit. Was there? What was your first role? Were you, were you in high school plays or were you <laughs> elementary plays? No, no. I, I, when we were in Nebraska, it was in Newport Harbor High School, uh, Horace Henson Junior High, Newport Harbor High School. Uh, in Newport Beach, got my class ring, my uh, my senior, well, the summer, right before my senior year, was, um, dad comes home and he says, well, we're just transferred to Nebraska. I'm like, what? <laughs> in the middle of the United States, about as far as you can get from either ocean, right in the center of the U.S., and here I was surfing every day, and, you know, just a little beach rat. And, uh, uh, you know, it was like, gosh, what a shock. So we got there, and uh, we uh, got there on a Tuesday. Saturday, we had horses, but we still didn't have a place to live. We were still in the guest quarters. We didn't have uh, living uh, quarters assigned to us yet. So every day, uh, the rest of the summer, I'd just go out to the stables and uh, just get on the horse and... My, uh, our horse it was a paint, a beautiful paint. And uh, he, he was a two-year-old. 
and he had the more character than any horse I've ever known. And he basically taught me how to ride. I'd just get up on a bare back and I'd start trotting and fall off. And, you know, I mean, they're just, it was, it was very funny. Very, very funny. So, anyway, he taught me how to ride. And uh, um, I became actually a very good rider. It came in handy later on when I was doing films. But um, I graduated then from Bellevue High School outside Omaha. And then I went to Omaha University before it was part of the University of Nebraska. So when we came back here um, in San Diego area, I went to Grossmont College. And I transferred. And transferred students get the dregs. There's really nothing left for them, you know. So um, uh, I just took what I could just to get into school. And one of the two classes was beginning acting. The other was an A class that I wound up didn't have to take because I had enough. So uh, <laughs> being as lazy as I am, I uh, dropped that one, and then I crashed all of the theater classes that I could because it was so much fun. And that's how I got into the whole thing. And then I went to the old Globe Theater there in San Diego and did plays, and theatrically, that's my home. And uh, so, you know... That was kind of a deal. I love the. I used to go to the Globe. I lived in San Diego, and what I liked is I lived in San Diego what twenty two years ago, I think. And what I loved about San Diego was they they have a lot of theaters, and they would do that pay what you can, like so you go to the Ticketmaster or whatever it is, and you pay a few bucks, and you can go to so many plays. And there was a lot of good theater in San Diego. Oh yeah, San Diego is the coolest. It's a city, but it's got a small town feel, which is what I like. I'm not a big city guy. And uh, I really enjoyed being in New York when I was there and when I was working. It was exciting and it's an incredibly high amp place. And it really makes you, uh, it's like you've got a pot of coffee in you. You know, it's just living in the place. But um, so San Diego was just very, very great. For me, that was very special. I loved it. So now when you started working for the old, in the old Globe and Productions, did you have Hollywood on your mind, or were you just trying to really learn your craft? No, I just uh, uh, just loved it so much. It was so wonderful getting into something that suddenly clicked for me. And uh, so I just started crashing all the classes that I could, and I... Uh, I took, well, acting was the first thing, but then I took production design, uh, set design, lighting design, makeup, history of the theater, every single thing that I could find. And uh, uh, it was it was great. I never thought about doing films or television or anything like that. It, it seemed like it, when you get into it like that, it's like you get into this purest thing. And so it's like... The theater, the theater is the pure, you know, <laughs> endeavor. I had friends that were going up to Hollywood, and I thought, yeah, boy, they do a game show or something, and you know, be a cheesy sitcom or some goofy thing, and it just seemed so, so beneath me because I was an actor. <laughs> <laughs> And then I had some friends run up and then at one point it just I realized, okay, I could get to where I'm doing the leads and the plays and I could go around a regional theater and I could make gosh, I could make five hundred dollars a week. That's pretty cool. And then I started thinking about it later on when other, you know, friends run up to LA and I thought if I went to LA and I got on a series, I didn't have to be the lead if I just you know, was a regular on a series. I could go to the same theaters and I could make $1,500 a week or $5,000 a week or whatever. I say, I don't think that I, I thought in that big of terms yet. I was thinking, you know, 1500 something like that. But I thought, boy, that's three times as much just for going and being in a cheesy old TV show. So, <laughs> okay, I can sacrifice that and uh, go to the Hollywood prison for a while and you know, do my, my time, and then I could get out and do the real stuff, which is the theater. And uh, so that's when I moved up. And, and, and uh, Eddie Foy was casting the show, Eddie Foy III, from the famous Foy's, Seventh Eddie 
before the Seven Little Foys. And he was the grandson of the original Eddie Foy. And um, uh, he was casting a show uh, called Harry O with David Jansen. And it was shooting the first season. It was shooting in San Diego. And he, he, I met him. Uh, one of his best friends he grew up with was a, by this time had gotten out of the business, was a building inspector. And he was the building inspector on my folks' home that they were building. And an adobe home, but he did the adobe right out of the ground, made the hinges on a forge, and I mean, we made the whole thing. And he was our inspector and became good friends with my folks. So he told Eddie about me, and I went in and I read, met with Eddie, and he cast me, and that's he's the one that got me going in the the television and eventually film side of everything. So, um, uh, then from there, I just thought, okay, I'll go up to LA. So moved up in '75 and started working. I just really, I mean, Eddie started casting me in things. Um, the the little Sunday morning soap opera type or religious themed soap opera shows, like Lamp Unto My Feet, and uh, the, the shows like that. And all of us actors just, you know, got to work. We got to work in all these shows, so it'd be great put some, a little gas in the tank and a little bit of bread in the table and we were happy. Well, and uh, just kept going from there. Well, it's amazing because you look at, you know, your early years on TV and you worked so much as, an, as a guest star or different things. I mean, and some great shows. I mean, Laverne and Shirley, The Rockford Files, Cannon. I mean, it seems, were you getting, were you just nailing every audition or was it? Well, I was really, really lucky. At my agent, Arnie Soloway, um, he would used to. He, he really thought. I guess he thought I had something, and he used to take me with him. He had this old '73 maybe Cadillac or '74 Cadillac convertible, the little fins. And he was a typical agent with the shirt unbuttoned down to his belly button, almost <laughs> with gold chains, you know, and a, and a, a tan that was darker than a, a, any human usually can tan, but. <laughs> With him, he just laid the sun all the time. But uh, he was a great guy, <laughs> a really, really good. Uh, they called him the hustler with a heart. And he uh, he would take, instead of just taking the pictures, he took the pictures of the other clients that he had, but he used to take me around and introduce me to the casting directors. And that was great because they could see me one-on-one and it'd leave a little impression with him instead of just a, a photograph. So uh, I, I would... Uh, Shoot, I, I started working like I was putting fires out. He told me that one time he was talking with a buddy of his, another agent, and they were comparing notes and bragging about how they had a client that was working. Like I did, uh, you did three shows last year, and this guy was, did, had one that did five shows last year. I did over two dozen shows in 18 months. And they, they all went what? <laughs> and so I was, I just was a ordinary looking guy that just, you know, was pleasant enough looking so I didn't offend everybody. And, and I seemed to have a sense of humor when I did the shows that they kind of liked. And I could do the leading man roles. A leading man that does comedy was kind of not that common. They, they would always tell me. And so uh, that's kind of how it all uh, Unfolded, and I'm just very, very lucky about that. Well, your first series, I guess, that you were regular on was Angie, right? Yeah, Angie was. Angie was. Uh, Angie was my very first. It was the series that was uh, that went. It was a mid-season replacement. The odd thing was, I had done a little, small, little guest shot on Laverne and Shirley about a year or a year and a half before. And in the scene, I'm Laverne's boyfriend, and I'm a bus driver. And um, I'm taking Laverne out, but she can't go out because she can't leave Shirley behind. So I get my buddy Moose, who is Mike McManus, uh, to uh, be her blind date. So we all go to a pool hall, and we're going to get a picture of beer and play pool, and, you know. And in come the bikers with their biker chicks and they take us out in the alley we're all going to have a knockdown drag out and and 
and uh, the girls remain in there and have the scene. So our scene's off camera, but they have the scene. And, this, and the girl that's the, the lead biker's chick, who's the lead of the chicks, was the nemesis of, of uh, Laverne. And that's where she says, I'm going to rip that L off your chest. You know, right. she had that big L <laughs> on her sweater. And Laverne says, you touch that L and your, your teeth go straight to Peoria. Well, her name was Angie. And she became a kind of a semi-regular in the show. And then from that, they spun it off and I think that was Carolina White that played her. And then it spun off, but then it wound up being Donna Pascal. And because in Laverne and Shirley, that girl Angie had gone off to, to marry a dentist. And uh, so when they did the spin off, they had her marrying a pediatrician. And then it wound up being me. They cast um, a guy that was a neighbor of mine who was a really swell guy, a very, very nice guy, and a good actor, John. Uh, he got he got cast, and then they had some shuffling around, and they recast it, and they cast, you know, different people in the show, and they recast him and put me in. So that's how I got it. And I was up with Mark Harmon. We were up for the same role, and I wound up getting that. And it was during that time, uh, after the first season, between the first and the second season, that um, my agent got a new agent in his office named Beth Boykew. And Beth said, hey, they're doing this film called Airplane. And she called up Howard Koch, who she had worked with, and said, Howard, I got your guy. Well, they had apparently been all over LA looking and they, they were trying out people, reading people, up San Francisco and Minneapolis, Chicago, um, New York and Dallas, they were all over the place trying to find people. And they never did find their guy, Julie, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Elaine or Ted. And um, so she called up and said, I got your guy. And he said, well, bring him by. So I went by and met with him and the boys, Jerry and David Sucker and Jim Abrams. And we all got along great. And then they had me read and they liked my reading. And then I got the screen test with Julie, which was great for me. I think that was very lucky. And uh, they liked the screen test, and they liked my spit take in the screen test. And uh, and then they come over to the set backstage on the and they said, hey, okay, you're the one. And that's how I found out about it. And uh, then we started filming it between that first half season we were a mid-season replacement on Angie so between that first half a season and the new second season we filmed Airplane and it overlapped with the second season by two weeks so I was doing both at the same time uh, rehearsing and shooting Angie and then going over and shooting Airplane and it was on the same lot fortunately that part of Airplane was being shot on Paramount and uh, Angie was also Paramount and it was the barroom scene with the Girl Scouts and the dance sequence and all that. And uh, so I was, I would, as soon as they'd say break for lunch on Angie, I literally would start running for the door. It was all pre planned. I had the guys trained. And they'd throw me a, a sandwich in a little zip dog baggie. And I was like a wide receiver going out. And I would catch it over the shoulder, run out get in the car and wolf it down as we drove across the lot to the other side of the lot to where the, the uh, sound stage where we were shooting the dance sequence. And then I would stay there until they were screaming for me to come back. I'd come back over, finish doing Angie, and then I'd go back and do some more airplane and then go to sleep. And then the next day, get up and do the same thing. And I don't remember ever being up to that point. I'd never been that tired in my life. Well, but it was all so fun. Oh, my, you're, it's so too great. You know, it's a series and a movie. Now, when Airplane, when they were testing it, all the actors, did they know it would be, did they, was it a big budget movie or did they weren't sure which way it was going to no. go? Because the writing was so different and I, it's one of those movies that everybody still quotes. I mean, what were they, what was their expectations? Well, it was just a small budget. It was a little budget, small budget film. Um, at the time, it was 3.7 million, three and a half, 3.7, something like that. 
And um, that was considered low budget back then. I mean, even today, it's, they're shooting so much more stuff in their independence that are shot for a lot less than that. But, but still, even today, that's uh, really small. And to get people, you know, like Lloyd Bridges, Robert Stack, Peter Graves, Leslie Nielsen, Ethel Merman, you know, on and on and on. To get all those people, you really had to, uh, I think they gave away points and all kinds of things just to get them. And, and uh, it's just had a buzz going around about it. They, they wanted the casting people thought, okay, it's a comedy, so let's get all the comedy people in. But they didn't really understand what the boys wanted. And they wanted to do a straight film. They wanted the comedy just to, to stand on its own. And it just would happen organically. But if you have if you have serious people doing it, it, it would made it that much funnier in airplay. You know, it wasn't a slapstick, yada yada yada, big goofy, here's a one liner and you know, that kind of a thing. It was saying it seriously and letting the ridiculousness of it carry the moment. And uh, so so uh, we kind of started thinking, hey, you know, maybe this has a chance to become a cult film on college campuses or something. And then later we thought, we started hearing about how well the, the dailies were going over that, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll have to... You know, I can't watch the dailies today, but I'll get them tomorrow on this film. You know, I got to brush my teeth today or something, whatever. But on this, they had to run the dailies over and over, sometimes four times, to get all the people in the studio in because they all wanted to see this wacky thing <laughs> that was going on. So uh, we started thinking, hey, uh, maybe something's going to, you know, maybe something's going to really be something here. So, so it was. Uh, it was really fun. It was really, really, really fun. Now, what was it like when it started becoming people seeing it? I mean, everyone probably started recognizing you. Yeah. Well, I had friends that, that uh, didn't come up to me on the street or if I'd see them somewhere. And they'd say, hey, I saw the, I saw the trailer for Airplane for your new movie. And I said, yeah. They said, those are all the jokes, right? And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, it was just so much fun. I remember taking my folks to a screening at the Directors Guild and introduced them to Peter Graves. And I asked Peter, how you know, how you doing? He says, good, good. Well, I've got a strange anchor for little boys lately. And of course, uh, <laughs> You and I were laughing, but my parents' jaws dropped. <laughs> they didn't know what, they hadn't seen the film yet. And I said, I'll explain it later, you guys. Um, it was just, uh, it was just crazy. It broke the records everywhere it played. Set new box office records. No. We were at that DGA sc screen, there was somebody sitting in front of me, right directly in front of me. And she was laughing so raucously and so loud. I couldn't hear the film. And I was going to reach up and said, hey, do you mind? But I didn't. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't because it was Bette Midler. <laughs> so. <laughs> so when the movie is becoming a big hit, well, first of all, I heard that Peter Graves was sort of your mentor. How did that, how that, relate? How did that relationship start? Mm, well, no, Bob Stack, I had done uh, a series that he starred in called Most Wanted, and I did a guest star spot on that. And he was one of the neatest guys. He was just one of the greatest guys. He was one of the neatest guys I've ever met, not just in, in Hollywood. I mean, he was just a really, really wonderful guy. Peter became good buddies on that, and he was wonderful. He, I uh, got to present him with an award up at the Ojai Film Festival just a few weeks before he died. Um, he wound up just walking down to the, to the uh, curb on the driveway to pick up the morning paper and had a heart attack and just died. But uh, he was terrific. Leslie was great fun to work with, but Leslie had that little fart machine <laughs> and he used to rip off these farts all the time on my close-ups. So 
so that was almost impossible to, <laughs> to keep a straight face. But we did. But we did. And uh, and Lloyd Lloyd was great, great fun. He was really nice. I liked him a lot. They all were. They were. Everybody was wonderful. Julie is so great, and I keep in touch with her. Her husband Richard and uh, I've run into Lorna Patterson uh, a few times and seen her, and she's just unbelievably talented. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's really fun. I've seen Al White a few times. He and Norm Van were the two black dudes that did the jive. Right. And and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we all get to get together. Uh, Lane Bryant, Frank Ashmore played the Navigator. Uh, I've seen Kareem uh, several things when we get together for airplane things or you know whatever. Um, and I don't know who all they're going to be able to get together, but I hope that this next year, um, on the 40th anniversary, they're going to get everyone together for uh, some things. It'd be great to see them all. Now, now the movie but, becomes. Uh, oh, sorry, the movie becomes a big hit. How does that change your career? What? What are the auditions you're getting now? And do they all, you just want pretty much comedy. What, what were you getting offered? Well, yeah, that was my first feature film. And all of a sudden, it was setting box office records on its way to becoming the, the biggest money-making comedy of all time, which it was and held that record for many years because it didn't cost that much to make, so it was in the profit. You know, I, they say three times your budget, so that's like ten and a half million or so. It's in profit, so that's that's making money too fast for. So, so uh, it really, it really uh, just was a smash. If you take something that's, uh, you know, something that makes twenty five million to make and it's a huge hit, but you got to get to seventy five million before it makes profit, according to their calculations so it was such a hit I remember being at a party and I had five different managers hitting on me to, to say hey you know you, you need some management here you, 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 hey listen let me handle you let me handle. and that, that had never happened before so that was pretty intense and uh, oh shoot Oh, she was very famous. I can't think of her name right now. She was like one of the, oh, Sue Mingers. She was one of the biggest agents, if not the biggest agent in all of Hollywood. She was, they, they also called her the shark. She was really tough. But she wanted to represent me. And I, I mean, we could have gone a whole different way if I'd gone with these people, but I just felt like Arnie had stuck with me for those years that we were together helped me build it all up, and I thought, well, it's time for him to be able to enjoy the fruits of it all, too. So uh, I just stuck with him. And uh, the thing was, he started sending scripts. It, you still go out and meet on things, but all of a sudden, I'm getting stacks of all these different scripts, and they say, read through this and see which one you like, and then we'll just do it. So that was new. That was <laughs> You can get really spoiled with that kind of... <laughs> That kind of deal. So, so that went on like that for years, and uh, that was really, really fun. And I just, uh, I didn't have anyone really, um, you know, managers help you guiding your career. And there are some actors that kind of are their own managers. They have their own sense of uh, what they do and what would be, you know, a good career move or whatever. But most of the actors, it's kind of, you know, they need a little guidance in a little help making the best, best moves. And Arnie was really, really excellent at negotiating the deals. I mean, but his his main experience had been in television, and it wasn't in uh, developing film stuff that much. So we were kind of, uh, both of us, you know, just looking for, boy, this looks like fun. Oh, this one looks like fun. And uh, so I, I picked films, you know, like that. And... Uh, I did some things that I thought were actually very good, but they were smaller, smaller films. And then they were here in the U.S. There was one in uh, Iowa, and there was one in um, New Jersey I did, and, and then here in L.A. And, and I was thinking, God, I wonder, when am I ever going get to get to go to Europe? 
you know, overseas to a film in a more exotic location or some cool kind of, a, you know. And then I did one in London that my friend Rob Cohen wrote with his co partner and writer. And um, so that was fun. Then I did one in, in uh, gosh, where is this? It seems like I, I did one in Paris. I did one in Spain. I did one in um, Malta. Uh, and I did one in, gosh, where was it? Next in France. And, and then I thought, gosh, when am I ever going to get to go home and do a film? Right. <laughs> because I was doing, these were all American films, but they were being shot on location over there. And, uh, and then, you know, eventually uh, in Malaysia. Um, uh, just all well, great stuff. But, um, but it was really exciting to just have scripts and just say, okay, here we go. It got to the point where then, you know, things kind of start to, to ease off a little bit, as they do with all of our careers. And I would uh, make a uh, uh, vacation plan to take the family and we would go. Like, for instance, I, it, it, this happened several times, so it became a thing. Uh, I'd make the plans, I'd pay for the tickets, I'd get the rooms booked and everything, then I'd get a job. So I have to send them, and then I go and join up after I finish the job. But I just thought, boy, if I need a job, just make some vacation plans to go to Hawaii, because I know I'll get one every time to screw it up. So, so uh, yeah, it was it was really fun. I've been really, really blessed with uh, very, very uh, fortunate, very lucky career. No. Got to work with really good people. Got to work with Art Carney. Barbara Hershey and Art Carney and Royal Dano. I don't know if you remember Royal Dano. I loved him. I always used to love him. Then all of a sudden I get to work with him. Um, uh, Jack Elam. Uh, uh, Sir John Dealgood. Um, I mean, it was just on and on and on. Just so many people. Well, you, you, were, really fun. you were doing the movies and then I actually watched the series Starman that you were on. Was it? What was it like? Oh, that. that was a. That was a, not, it. Was it was a good show, and it was based, I believe, on a movie that starred Jeff Bridges. And right, it was thirteen years later. Right after the, the boy had been born. Now, for you, because you had done so many movies, but now this is another series again, which you hadn't really done a series really since Angie. Was it a lot easier for you, or was it more grueling? Because you had to be the set every oh, day. He's grueling in the fact that I'm in almost every scene, and so I'm working more, you know, longer than everybody. But you know, that's kind of the price you pay if you want to be the star of the show. You're going to have to pay the price, and that's. I've been. I have worked on films and TV shows. I've worked. I've worked some. I've had 22 hour days. I mean, that's a pretty long day, <laughs> and uh, you're pretty exhausted the next day even if you know they give you eight hours of sleep still you're exhausted but uh, uh, I had a deal with Columbia TriStar um, and it's when they were over with Warner Brothers at the Warner Brothers lot and, and for those those few years it was the name was changed from Warner Brothers to the Burbank Studios and then later it was changed back to Warner Brothers um, but um, that was uh, uh, that was a, a three picture deal and television developmental series development deal that uh, Arnie had, had negotiated and we kept coming up with films they'd come up with an idea for film I said man not, don't like that one and what about this one if some really cheesy dorky thing said no I don't like that Have you got something like this and then, well, we'll look, and well, we don't have them. Yeah, no. Well, how about that? Well, that one's taken, and oh, we can't. So the the deal ran out. Finally, I got paid on that. They, you know, my retainer on it, but, but uh, we never did a film deal out of it. But the very last day, they kept coming up with these ideas for series, and it sounded good at first, and then we'd really get into it, and it was like, no, man, this is not good, and. 
it literally was the last day of the, of the deal. And they, they called me up and they said, I got it. I got it for you. And he said, what is it? And instead of telling me like he normally would, he said, yeah, I'll let these guys tell you. We got to get together. <laughs> I said, okay. So I went over and met John Mason and Mike Gray, and they were the two guys that had developed this series idea for Starman. And my first thought was, oh man, that had been one of my favorite scripts that I'd read, one of the two favorite scripts that I'd read that I wanted to do. And um, I wasn't a big enough name back then, you know, before Airplane and everything, you know. And so uh, I was doing guest star spots, but I didn't have a big enough name. And of course, they got Jeff Bridges. He, you know, he's a huge name. And so they did they did the film with him. I always loved that script, and had wished that I could have done it. But I didn't like the idea of following in somebody foot, uh, else's footsteps and and kind of you know doing a what are you doing your Jeff Bridges impression or you know what I mean that right. kind of a thing and so I was uh, I don't know uh, but they really they, they I really liked Mike and John so much and I said okay well let's just give it a shot so we did and that wound up being one of my two favorite things airplane being my the most important thing in my career in one of my absolute favorite things that I've ever done and Starman was the other thing that was just a treasure. Angie was also terrific, but was inside the studio, and after a while, I was just getting suffocated in there. And we had a change from the uh, the first season, and I thought it it had some people that had been on Cheers, some of the writers, and then we didn't have them anymore. And I thought it lost a little of the of the quality. Um, and it still was really fun. It was a lot of, you know, the people were great. And, but uh, Starman, on the other hand, was just like a family. Uh, we all were on location together. The crew felt like they were part of it. I loved being the guy who was, I, I was almost a part owner of it. I was a proper, what they call a profit participant in the thing. I didn't get residuals. I got a piece of it when it was sold. And so, so, and they told me, if this, if you don't do this, then it won't get done. And so I really felt like I had a big, big part of that whole thing. And I loved the people, the exec producers. Michael Douglas was an exec producer on it um, because he had done the film, produced the film. And he wasn't there much, but he was there a little bit, but he was great. He's, he's just amazing. But Jim Hirsch and Jim Henderson were our two exec producers that were writers also and that were there all the time. And they were wonderful to work with. And the whole crew, our directors, um, the cast that we had, I mean, everybody. It was just wonderful going to work, being with them every day. And uh, so that was very special. You, know, you were, we were talking about the, you know, the doing the Jeff Bridges thing. I was on a... Uh, a uh, press junket. It was an ABC show, and uh, uh, I was sitting there. I was over, I think it's Century City, and you go around and sit in front of the camera and you do all the interviews, then you go in a room, have a long table with about 15 people on the other side, and you would sit there alone on your side, and they would all throw questions at you. And they were from all the newspapers all over the country, the big major papers. And uh, they would ask questions about this, and I'd answer it, and it was all great, and there was this one woman, and she was sitting just about right across from me, and she sat there with a, a sour look on her face the whole time, and her arms folded, and like she was just really not into it. It finally got to her, and uh, they said, yeah, do you have a question? And she just was staring at me, and she said, how do you like playing Jeff Bridges? And all of the people all went, ooh. I mean, it was so rude. And it was just, just like, you know, I, I, and I kind of was taken back a little bit. And I thought, wow. And uh, I settled in and I thought about it for a second. And I said, well, I mean, the guy is an alien that I'm playing. But uh, after 
13 years, even he knows that Jeff Bridges' body would smell pretty bad, so he took mine. <laughs> and everybody fell on the floor laughing and they wrote in, it got in all these uh, the columns all over the country. And she just sat there and just, you <laughs> just, <laughs> and so it was, next? <laughs> to the next guy. And uh, so that was the only one of those. He was, uh, he was the only little turd in the bowl of soup otherwise <laughs> the rest of them were all terrific and uh you know it was it was really good people loved it abc didn't really know what to do with it they thought it was it, well it's a it's a sci-fi thing but it wasn't really a sci-fi thing it was it was kind of like uh, highway to heaven and the fugitive and if you mix them together only it was a father and son being on the run and, and it had the magic of Highway to Heaven, but it didn't have all the sci-fi, you know. And um, so they, they kept slopping it around at different time slots, and they never really advertised it. They just said, well, we put it behind a popular show and then let it carry over from that show. And they moved us, I think we had six different time slots, which was unbelievable. And they gave us the death time slots, you know, the ones that were up against the, the big, big shows that had all, you know, took all, sucked all the air out of the room. Um, so they put us up against them to try to see. But uh, we did well whenever we had a chance for people to catch up to us. But then uh, they canceled it. We found out later that they were so torn that it really was... Um, literally the last split second it was it was just the last millisecond of making a decision they really were torn and they told bob urich who was doing i think vegas at the time and he told me he said yeah they came up to me and said the biggest mistake we made this season was not renewing starman and and by that time it was too late everybody's gone they're off to doing other shows and but uh, I think if it would have gone just one more season, if they picked it up for one more season, it would have gotten legs and it would have run for at least four or five years. And, uh, and then that would be enough for syndication and it really would have been, you know, it would have been a great, great thing for everybody. The crew kept promising that we'd get them back on the show the next season because they loved it. They loved everybody on it. We all got along really well. It was just great, very, very, very special. So you you yeah. you've had you know the movies and then this show series, which has to be a little heartbreaking because as you said, you loved it. And it's the second best thing. You, you're your second favorite thing you've done. Now you eventually switched into anime, uh, voice voicing. Uh, you played Iron Man. How did that come about? Well, they just I think they just um, asked if I was interested in doing any of that stuff, and I said. I, that could be fun. And so I, I, that's kind of how it was. When they cast me, uh, Stan Lee had me come up to his office, and I met him, and he was just delightful. He was like a kid. And uh, we laughed and choked and just had a lot of fun. And and uh, then he signed a, a cell, you know, the cells they use in the animation yeah. of Iron Man to me from Stan it was really, really, really great. It was really, really fun. And I had a great time doing it. We had a lot of fun. Jim Cummings and, um, geez, a whole bunch of people. There were just some of the really, really great voiceover people uh, were in that, did the show. And uh, so that was fun. But then it didn't, you know, I don't know how animation, the world of animation works. That's kind of a, a little different for me. I don't quite understand all of it. But you did play Tony Stark in a three uh, three s series. Yeah, it was it was it was really fun. I love doing it. It's a uh, it's just a very it's a it's funny. It's a very clickish uh, outfit, and uh, uh, you know people say, "Oh yeah, well you've got a name and you're you got it easy because you got a name." Well, it's not true. It doesn't work that way. Um, but the people that do it are are. Uh, Really, really talented folks, you know, and uh, 
there's a different kind of different style of acting, the voice acting. So I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. It was a lot of fun. Now, through your career, did you get back into theater at all? Because that seemed like it was your first love. I I, I did a little bit. Um, I did love letters about five times, six times, I it was, um, with uh, three or four different ladies. Donna Pestow was the last one that I did it with, that I'd done Angie with, and we had a lot of fun. I did it with Annie Lockhart. Um, the best performance that I ever did was with Donna Dixon, who um, uh, we did that in Long Beach, and it was a magical performance, magical night, and... Uh, things just clicked. You felt the audience and you'd feel the gasp in the audience at the end of the show. I mean, that was magical. And she was married to Dan Aykroyd. I think Dan was there that night, I believe. And, uh, but yeah, it was, um, that was great fun to do. Um, tried getting that together with Julie Haggerty and, and, uh, we were going to try it, trying to do it, but we never got that theater, uh, all worked out. Um, I did uh, a Christmas Carol during the holidays a few years ago at the uh, Thousand Oaks Civic Art Center, which was great fun. I narrated the play and played uh, the old narrator who, in the end, it turns out that he's telling the story. How do you know it so well? Oh, haven't I introduced myself? My name is Timothy. He's actually Tiny Tim. That's now grown up as an old guy. So it was really, really fun, fun to do. And uh, Alan Hunt directed that. It was an old friend. He used to be on Voice of Out of the Sea. Um, did a lot of different things. His his aunt, Marsha Hunt, is still alive. Wonderful actress from the 40s. She's a, I think she's 100 now, or 101 just remarkable wonderful elegant lady but um, anyway so we did that and uh, and there were some other things almost we almost got done but didn't quite but now I'm starting to wonder about uh, learning three hours of dialogue (laughs) that's the treachery that is the sheer torture so but, you know, some stuff just falls together. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, actors are never retired. They're just between films or plays. Right, I was saying so, that. Uh, it's it's funny, yeah, because actors always work. Now, what kind of roles do you look for these days when it comes to TV or movie? Because you are such a... You're, everyone knows your face. Everyone knows who Robert Hayes is. I mean, it's just because everyone saw Airplane. What What kind of roles are you looking for these days? I don't know. I've just I've been dealing with uh, this other stuff. I'm just really enjoying um, being my son's roadie when he was little, as he was getting into his music. And uh, every once in a while, I hear a whisper from somebody. Other, hey, look at that roadie up there sitting at the drums. That looks like an actor, Robert Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of fun doing that. But he's um, he's really doing well with his music. He's also been getting into acting doing really some really wonderful stuff, small little little films and things so far and, and things that they put together and doing improv and, and doing really well with that. But uh, he's got a song out right now called Sleep Talking that is, um, I think it's over 160,000 streams. It just came out about a month ago. So it's doing really, really well. But, uh, and he's got three more coming out over the next three months of this EP. They're just releasing them one song at a time. And uh, uh, so I've been doing that. I've been uh, trying to get the little rebuild going on the house. I had a little little misfortune last November. And so uh, we're trying to see about getting that to uh, the home lost in the fire, so in California fires. So uh, we're trying to see about getting that rebuilt. So that's taken a lot of time. So I'm basically just having, you know, somebody comes to me, they've done this, they come to me and want me to do something. And I've, I've done, you know, some cameos, I've done things here and there that were just 
fun to do. I did Sharknado. I had a cameo in that because my son said, oh, Dad, you got to do it. <laughs> so I did that and had just the most fun with Anthony Ferrante and Ian and, and uh, all of them. They were great. And uh, But some, they asked me to do things in some, and it just was not, the, it wasn't me. It wasn't the right thing. I didn't want to do it. But I'd suggest people that I knew. Uh, there was one they wanted me to do, and I thought, my gosh, my friend John O'Hurley would be perfect for this. Actually, you really need for this role. So I don't know if they ever went to him or not, but um, but I just, you know, I like, to, I like to pass it on to people I think would actually be able to do a better job of it than me. Now, so, now yeah. being that, you know, you've had, you know, you've had success and your first movie was a hit, were you happy when your son decided to go into the entertainment world, even though it was music at first? Were you were you happy about that, or do you sit there and go, hey, you know, the life can be a little crazy? Oh, well, tell him it can be nuts. I said that you shouldn't do it unless you are just consumed by it. If you can't do anything else in your mind, you just cannot live without doing it, then do it. But otherwise, get yourself a real job, you know. And uh, so he gets into the two hardest things that you can do, music <laughs> and acting. So, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's their choice. Whoever's going to do this stuff, it's their choice. You just can tell them uh, the best advice that you can give them. And, and we used to sit there, and I, you know, he'd sit with me and I would watch movies with him. We would talk about, oh, look at that. And, oh, look at that there. Look at the way they shoot that camera angle. And you see how that's called a master, and then they come in and they do close-ups here, and, and they always you don't cross over this line on the camera when you're doing that. Look at the lighting there. Oh, man, isn't that gorgeous? And I love old film. Turner Classic Movies is one of my favorite channels. And I just love old, you know, comedies. William Powell, William Powell and Myrna Loy, the film man series, is some of my favorites. He's one of my favorite actors. Um, uh, Cagney is, and Cooper, Stewart, Fonda, Terry Grant, you know, I mean, these guys are just, the ones that I always wanted to do roles like that, you know. Um, Brando, to me, probably you have the finest performances ever captured on film from Martin Brando, but that's not my kind of role, not my kind of, you know, character that I would play. But to me, he's like the finest actor. But you still learn so much. You don't have to be that guy. Like, Alfred Bogart, it wasn't the kind of things I would do. Um, Cagney wasn't necessarily the kind of things. Like, my buddy Michael Cavanaugh, he's like a Jimmy Cagney kind of, you know, he's got that energy and that kind of uh, whole style and everything. He reminds you a lot of Cagney. I don't. But you can still learn great things from these great actors. So uh, uh, that's what I tried to do was just tell him things that I had come across. And I think a lot of kids these days, and it, it applies to almost everything, like golf, for instance. Take golf. You look at all the kids that are out there swinging away because they get uh, the visual of a great swing on YouTube. We never had that when we were kids. We didn't have YouTube, didn't have the internet. And you didn't have a thing where you could just pull up something on TV and say, oh, I want to watch Shell's Wonderful World of Golf. You had to wait until that was on. And if it re-ran, then you could see it again, but you just couldn't bring it up on demand. Today, you can bring anything up on demand. You can go to YouTube, find anything you want. You can find golf instruction. You can find uh, Tiger Woods and uh, uh, Gene Saracen, you can find uh, the great, you know, uh, Bobby, uh, 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 oh, geez, one of my favorite golfers of all time, who founded the, uh, uh, he, Bobby, he founded the Masters. Anyway, but you've got all these guys, and you can see what the proper swing is supposed to be like, and all the different swings, but you can still see where they're alike, right, when they hit the ball. Well, they can do the same thing with acting. You can hear actors talking about acting, directors talking about directors and about actors. Um, you can go online and have these uh, master's classes 
with all these incredible actors and teachers giving classes online. So actors nowadays have such an advantage in developing skills quickly instead of just, you know, like the way we used to do it was we, you take acting classes and then you get on the stage and you just start working at it. And you just start learning from the audience that works, that doesn't work. And that's why live theater is so good. It's so excellent. But nowadays you can, you can kind of get a foot up. The only thing that they don't do nowadays is uh, I'm amazed when I, I'll talk to young actors and you know, say, so now, you know who Clark Gable is? No. You know who Judy Cagney is? Huh? <laughs> Henry Fonda? No. Jenny <laughs> Stewart? No. <laughs> Marlon Brando? Yeah, I heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like such a waste. Yeah. It's like they're, they're, the, they're the icons. They're like the Babe Ruths. You know, the, they, can... well, they don't, they have no clue about of anything of the history of of this, they have no clue about uh, who it was that made this whole thing that they do the way it is, and kind of were the the people that, that were the pioneers in it all. And that's kind of sad, unfortunately, because you can learn so much by watching them. Joel McRae, oh my God! I mean, watch him, watch Glenn Ford with that kind of a little inner turmoil thing that Glenn Ford had going on. Watch the silent films. Watch John Barrymore in uh, A Beloved Rogue. When you watch The Beloved Rogue, he, there he is uh, as uh, Francois Villon, the poet in Paris. And when he's banished from Paris, he turns on that turntable when they, they have him uh, as the the clown prince and he's running around they're all drinking and celebrating and it's a big thing that they do all the poor poets and beggars and everyone so he's the clown prince and then they come in and they say uh, the king has banished you from Paris because you've written things that offend the king and so get out or you'll be you know chopped at the guillotine or whatever and they turn the turntable and you see on his face he's looking as the turntable turns he's looking at Paris, which is his heart. You, by banishing him from Paris, you've torn out his heart and he's seen it for what might be the last time. And watching that, I remember watching that when I was first studying at, at Cosmo College. We were over to Buddy's house and it was a PBS channel. And I didn't know who this guy was, John Barrymore. I'd never heard of this and it was a silent film. We were watching it. And I was mesmerized, and I realized watching that scene, wow, this is when acting changed. It changed from the broad, you know, the, the hands on the forehead, and oh, my <laughs> heart. The broad uh, musical acting. And this changed to a real acting. And the next time, I think, was the next big, you know, explosion of that was with the generation of Montgomery Clift, Marlon Brando, and and then James Dean came right after them. I mean, he was the young kid in it. But, whoa. So to see those periods and see how it changes, you can learn so much watching all these guys and women, all these great women. And, uh, uh, it's just kind of sad to me that they don't they don't see that. Yeah, it is. Now, it's one thing is that you know you, you made a good point about you can get everything on demand now, and you can pull up, you can yeah. talk into your thing. Now, you've probably gotten a resurgence in people recognizing you because Airplane is on TV a lot, and I think a lot of parents introduce their kids to it because it is it's an iconic comedy movie. Do you yeah. are you surprised like sometimes the the variance of ages that come up to you and say we love the Airplane. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the funny thing is, it's 40 years, 40 years ago right now, we were shooting it. And next year, the 40th anniversary. And after being in theaters, then all of a sudden, it comes out after a while, because back then it wasn't as fast as it is nowadays. But after one, they released it on, uh, it was out on VHS, and 
then it was on cable. And then later on, DVD comes out, and then they release it again with the Don't Call Me Shirley edition, and they had the little outtakes on that, so then people bought that. But once it came on cable, it seemed like it was playing on cable all the time. And so I had people come up at one of those little autograph signing things, and they they were, I'm guessing they were 40-ish, late 30s, somewhere in there. And uh, they had their son, who I think was 16 or 17, a daughter that was like 12, uh, another daughter that was maybe 10, a son that was six, and a little boy that was three. And they all were right there, and they all were just so excited. And they said that it was their favorite film. And I said, three? I said, okay, that's it. You're my youngest <laughs> fan that I've ever had. And they said, oh, we've got a one-year-old at home. And every time we put it on, he goes, airplane, airplane. I said, are you kidding me? So, so I mean, it, it's it's crazy. They People say I showed, uh, you know, or I'm waiting to be able to show my son the movie because they didn't want to see the the jello and panning up to the jiggling boobs or the naked boobs coming through the shot. That's the one scene they don't want to have their kids see yet. And I said, well, when they're really tiny, it's, they're just looking up and they're saying, oh, food. <laughs> so there shouldn't be a problem with that, you know. And other people say, yeah, well, that's the way I looked at it. That's why I showed up in the film. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, it's it's... It doesn't surprise me, but it does. I mean, I'm just amazed by it, and it's wonderful. The whole thing is because of the boys. Jerry and David and Jim are the geniuses that created this. I think that um, fortunately for me and fortunately for Julie and for all the rest of us, Lauren and everybody else, that we, we had the kinds of temperament and the talent and whatever that fit that and and with their the, and I mean brilliance and I'm not using it just in the you know people say oh that's brilliant you know oh oh that's brilliant oh look at that look at that wave oh look it's brilliant no it's really beautiful it's a wave but, you know they just use brilliant for everything right. but these guys are brilliant they're geniuses they're absolute brilliant when it comes to to uh filmmaking and comedy and even even the comedy dramas you know um that jerry directed with uh, uh what was the ghost remember ghost yeah yeah Pat, oh, patrick swayze wonderful so those guys it was what they wrote and their sense of what they wanted how they saw their vision of it because if the, if the casting folks had had their way, they would have had all these comedians in there and everybody would be looking at them and saying, yeah, when are they going to make me laugh? Okay, when are they going to make me laugh? And with us, we weren't known as comedy people. You know, Peter Graves, Bob <laughs> Stack, you know, Lloyd. <laughs> Leslie wasn't known for that. He was known as uh, a leading man. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid in a Disney series, Marion's Marauders. It was the the Continental Army and the you know the uh, Revolution, and he had a, a group of guys that would today be like the Green Berets, and they would lead them in, and but they just had you know tricorns and things they wore, and I just loved that show. Well, then later on, here he is doing um, things with I don't know if it was Doris Day or who, but it was light comedy like that, and then here he is on Bonanza playing a bad guy. And and so you never thought of him as being a wacky, funny guy. Uh, he said that he always wanted to do it, but he never could quite the, quite, uh, find the right vehicle or quite be able to, you know, get himself to do it. And so when these guys offered it to him, he said they he walked up to the door to walk into this wacky world, but the boys gently pushed him in. <laughs> and that was at the beginning of the goofy, wacky Leslie Nielsen that we all knew and loved. But uh, that was their brilliance, was knowing that and and having it done seriously. And uh, so I give them all the credit 
Well, you did a great performance in it, and you've made millions of people, millions upon millions of people laugh, and you've had a great career. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, it's just so funny. It was just well, thank you. It was so weird that your picture showed up. You were in picture with Joey Medina, who was fishing with you guys. And I was sitting there. I just, <laughs> I just figured out what time you're going to be on. And I'm like, and I, as I said in the beginning, I love stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's just so yeah. random. But so I want to thank you, Robert. Yeah. People, people, go check out Robert Hayes' IMDb. Watch his movies. If you haven't seen Airplane, you know what? I don't even want to talk to you. Don't even listen to the show. If you haven't seen Airplane, there's something <laughs> wrong with it. So people, go check out Robert. Uh, go to my website. Well, it's going to be fun to see what we do this next year for the 40th anniversary. I hope there's going to be some fun things. So There should be. Be prepared. I will be. Be prepared, people. So people, check Robert out. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 740 episodes. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. And follow me on Twitter at Cooper Talk. So remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.